This morning, our Dharma talk will be Ryokan interpreted by uh, Reverend Shahaku Okamura. Reverend Okamura is a Japanese Soto Zen priest and the founder and abbot of the San Shin Zen community in Bloomington, Indiana, where he and his family currently live. Uh, Reverend Okamura was born in Osaka, Japan in 1948. He received his education at Kamazawa University in Tokyo, where he studied Zen Buddhism. In 1970, he was ordained by his teacher, Koshu Okayama in Antiji, where he practiced until Okiyama, Okiyama retired in 1975. Following his teacher's wishes, uh, Reverend Okamura traveled to the US where he co-founded Valley Zendo in Massachusetts, continuing the, the style of Zen, Zazen practice of his teacher until 1981. In that year, he returned to Japan and began translating the writings of his teacher, Ukiyama and Ehei Dogen from Japanese into English. He also spent time teaching at Kyoto Soto Zen Center. After returning to the United States, Reverend Okamura taught at the Minnesota Zen Meditation Center in Minneapolis from 1993 to 96, and then founded the San Shun Zen community. Also from 1997 until 2010, he served as director of the Soto Zen Buddhism International Center in San Francisco, which is an administrative office of the Soto School of Japan. His daughter, <clears throat> Yoko Okamura, made a short documentary entitled Sit uh, about purpose in life as seen through the eyes of a Buddhist monk and his son. The film explores how her father's Buddhism affected his parenting and the results it had on her brother Masaki and herself. And I think uh, Peja would like to add a few words of welcome. Um, I should have coached uh, Anne a little bit on the pronunciations. I'm sorry, Anne. <laughs> the preacher is actually Uchiyama Roshi. Um, but I really uh, thank you so much for coming to Oksan. Your uh, Oksan has been a great inspiration to me for many years because I find him to be a very sincere practitioner and focused very much on Zazen, which is the reason I got into Soto Zen. And uh, I just want to tell a short story to, I think, which illustrated to me before I even met him, his sincere practice. One of my friends uh, wrote to him and asked him to do some shopping for her in Japan once. Um, she wanted a silk robe and some other things. And um, she read me his letter uh, when she got it back and it, he wrote, okay, I will get these things for you. But remember, Dogen Zenji did not go to China to go shopping. <laughs> <laughs> and that then from then on, I wanted to meet him, <laughs> meet Joe So thank you so much for coming. And I'm really looking forward to these, um, uh, what you have to say about Ryokan. Thank you very much, Tejo-san. I'm ha happy to have a chance to give a talk today to the people in your Sangha. I often visited uh, Asheville area in North Carolina. After I moved to Bloomington, I had once a year I had a, a, a walking retreat, walking meditation retreat at uh, Hot Spring. So during that time, I visited there uh, once a year, and I had so I had uh, I have uh, many friends in uh, Tejo Sand Sangha. Uh, <clears throat> today, I'd like to introduce this book, Ryokan uh, Interpreted. This book uh, is very new, published last month from uh, Dogen Institute, 
ドゲンインスティチュートイザパートオブソートゼンコミュニティーディレクターデイビッド・トンプソン have、uh, so many work to organize my teaching activity and also working transcription work also he edited、uh, this book、uh, main part of this book is、uh, based on my lecture on ryokan's poems at、uh, Berkeley Zen Center Uh, after moving to Bloomington, I, I was sometimes be,、uh, invited by San Francisco Zen Center to have a、uh, Genzoe. Their Genzoe、uh, uh, is、uh, seven days, not five days. So I need to talk、uh, 13、uh, lectures on Dogen in English. It was really A、difficult work to me. And、uh, right after San Francisco Zen Center Genzoe, I was invited to、uh, Berkeley Zen Center and they、uh, asked me to give, to give a morning Dharma talk and an afternoon workshop. And I decided to talk on Ryokan's poems.、Uh, You know, to talk on Dogen, especially Shobo Genzo, is really difficult. I have to be to study thoroughly and to be very careful.、Uh, so, after seven days of Genzo, I was completely、uh, tired. But next day, I had to talk and、uh, talk on Ryokan, and his poem is really.、Uh, Uh, joyful to me. You know, I, I don't need to study beforehand because I, I think I understand Ryokan. I still don't, I don't think I, you know, I、uh, completely understand Dogen, but I think、uh, Ryokan is much、uh, closer to me. So it's a kind of a fun. Also, I had a、uh, I had the same experience of doing takuhatsu or begging as uh, uh, Ryokan did. So his、uh, practice and his、uh, <clears throat> poems on takuhatsu or begging is something I could、uh, understand through my personal experiences. So I, I think several times I gave. Uh, Ryokan's uh, lectures on Ryokan's poems at Berkeley Zen Center, and some people transcribed my lectures. Uh, and uh, former uh, head teacher of Milwaukee Zen Center, Tonen Okana,、uh, edited those transcriptions. And、uh, she, Tonen and、uh, Hoko Kanegis, the vice abbot of San Shinji now, went to Japan and visited Ryokan's、uh, country in Echigo. And Tonen wrote an introductory essay for this book. And Hoko took、uh, many beautiful photos of where Ryokan actually lived. And、uh, Tonen's Dharma Ea Tomon made uh, this uh, uh, artwork on the、uh, cover and inside the book.、Uh, so, this is a production product of、uh, many people's you know, cooperation. So, I really appreciate all those people's、uh, hard work. <coughs> Uh, I, before talking, I'd like to talk one、uh, poem on Zazen from this book by Ryokan. But before that,、uh, probably some people who are not so familiar with Ryokan and his 
uh, life. So I uh, briefly talk about who Ryokan was. Ryokan was uh, as uh, introduced uh, Soto the monk who was born 1758 and passed away 1831. So he lived second half of 18th century and beginning of 19th century. Uh, you know, where the place he was born was called Echigo in that time. Today, uh, that area is called Niigata, Niigata Prefecture. Uh, he was born in a, into a very uh, prestigious family in that area from the, I think from the 14th century. Uh, his family, his family name was Yamamoto. His family was a, a town head of a, a city, a town named Izumozaki. This is a, a small town, but important uh, place for, because it has a port for the ships uh, to, for the trade, Trading, trading uh, during that time. Uh, and also, Izomodaki is a port to uh, sail to Sado, a uh, uh, big island, one of the big, big islands in Japan, Sado, was an uh, important island for Japanese economics because they uh, uh, had a uh, gold mine in this island. So this is, is Mozaki was in very important place. And the Ryokan's family was a town, a town head of that uh, port. Uh, so, uh, but, uh, you know, when Ryokan was born, uh, this, his family was kind of uh, uh, declining, you know, in a precious, uh, pre <clears throat> and traditional family, uh, they have uh, authority, but they are not so greedy. They became well educated, so they didn't want to, you know, compete and, you know, get more and more power and money. They become a kind of a sophisticated uh, intellectuals. So uh, even uh, his father. Uh, was a uh, <clears throat> town head, but uh, he was not, he didn't, he couldn't do a good job as a, that, that position. Rather, he was a famous as a haiku poet. So he preferred writing haiku instead of working, uh, managing his business. So uh, his family was, situation was getting uh, was getting declined and his father wanted to retire uh, when Ryokan was 17 years old that was <clears throat> uh, 1775 he so he became the kind of a assistant of his uh, father and he did some uh, business, uh, but he didn't like it. And he wasn't a good person for that kind of uh, political and uh, trading business. So he was, he escaped from that responsibility. And somehow he escaped to a uh, so those them Buddhist temple named Koshoji and became a monk. 
this is, I think this is a big, uh, fa first big change. Uh, before that, he went, he studied uh, Chinese literature and uh, uh, teachings such as Confucianism and uh, Taoism. So he went to a academy, private academy near his family. So he was well educated and he loved literature and he didn't, uh, he was not uh, a practitioner practical person in terms of uh, politica political and economical work. So he escaped. That was one big change. And uh, he stayed with at this temple with his teacher for a few years. But one time, a uh, great Zen master whose name was uh, Dai Ming. Hokusen. Uh, actually, Dining was the same name with Katagiri Oshis, same Chinese character. But this person, Dining Kokusen, was uh, about of Enzuji Monastery in Okayama Prefecture. Okayama was facing a uh, Jap uh, inland sea, and so it's very warm place. It's very different from Echigo. In Echigo, it's a northern uh, western part of Japan, and uh, Echigo was called a snow country. They had a lot of snow every year. Sometimes they have 10 feet of snow. So same as Echizen. Echizen, uh, Echizen was where Dogen uh, lived at uh, Eheji. Echige, Echizen and Echu and Echigo are all connected and facing Japan Sea. And you know the in the win in, in the winter the wind from north uh, blow, bring a lot of moisture and hit the mountain in Japan and the uh, 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 humid air go up and come down as snow. So they had a lot of snow, but in Okayama probably they had no snow at all. So he must be happy about that climate. And he practiced with this Zen master uh, for 12 years from uh, 1779 to uh, 91. So he was uh, 21 years old to 33 years old. So he was trained as a Soto Zen monk and he stayed with this Zen master for 12 years. So he, I think he was almost ready to receive transmission and become a temple priest. But somehow, uh, again, he escaped. <laughs> he escaped from the monastery. First, he escaped from his family business, family responsibility. And second, he escaped from the monastery and escaped from the, uh, you know, responsibility to be a temple priest or a Zen master. Uh, in this book, I wrote about why he had to escape from the monastery. And after that, he never lived in Soto Zen temple. So that was the second escape. See, he escaped from family business and he escaped from the monastery. And after that, uh, until 1996, for about five years, 
uh, we don't know where he was. It seems he was traveling around as a wanderer. And when he was 39, that is 1797, he returned to his his uh, country, home country, but he didn't uh, return to his uh, home, his family, but he lived in a small uh, hut or hermitage. Named Gogo Am. Gogo means uh, five cups. Ang is a hut or hermitage. So the name of that building was called uh, Five Cups. This means five cups of rice. That was uh, the uh, hermitage was uh, on the mountains and at top of the mountain there was a uh, one of the oldest Buddhist temple in that area called uh, Kokujoji. This is a big, big Shingon temple. And uh, originally this uh, hermitage, Gogo An was uh, built for the retired abbot of this big, temp big, big temple and to support the retired abbot's life, the temple uh, <clears throat> provide five cups of rice a day. Five cups of rice is more than enough for one old person. So, but uh, this doesn't mean the person had to eat everything, all the rice, but they can, uh, sell the rice and uh, get some money and support and uh, get some other things. So that is the meaning of Gogo An. But when Ryokan came back, no one lived there. So the temple allowed him to stay, but he, uh, he was not the retired temple so retired more about so he was not provided the rice so he he had to do takuhatsu uh, takuhatsu is begging when we do taku, practice takuhatsu we hold a oryoki ball like this and uh, continue to not shouting but saying ho And I, we stand each and every uh, houses, just saying ho. And uh, if the person or people in the family make some donation, uh, we chant uh, the very short uh, verse of, about the virtue of uh, uh, dana. Dana Paramita. And he walked uh, around the villages, around that places, and often he traveled much far, far away. And uh, there are many uh, anecdotes about Ryokan. He, in, the, in those uh, stories, he was a very uh, funny person, funny, innocent person. Sometimes when he walked on the uh, street in the village, uh, P, uh, children want, wanted to pray with him. Then he forget about doing begging uh, and he prayed with children uh, until sunset. So he didn't get anything. <laughs> and one anecdote was he had a, a 
particular name of the game. Uh, what is Kakurembo? Hide and seek. And uh, when uh, he hide himself in somewhere very difficult to find, and children uh, gave up because uh, you know it was almost sunset. Uh, their parents came to pick, to pick them up, and he, Yokan, stayed in that place entire entire night. And the next day, next morning, someone came and found Yokan and said, "What are you doing?" <laughs> then Yokan said, uh, "See, children found me." <laughs> that kind of funny story. There are so many. So, you know, those such stories are very famous in Japan. Even uh, elementary school children know Yokan because of that kind of uh, stories. And also, uh, some of his waka poems were on the uh, textbook for, of uh, elementary school. So, I think Yokan was one of the most well known Soto Zen monk probably more popular than Dogen. You know, no, children don't, don't, don't know Dogen. I didn't know Dogen until I became a high school student. But uh, all, almost all children know Ryokan. Anyway, that was how he uh, lived for about uh, 20 years. Uh, and in uh, 1816, he was 58 years old. It seemed he was too old to live in such a you know, remote place. So he moved to a Shinto shrine on the foot of the mountain named Otogo. Jinja Otogo Shrine. And there was, a, again, there was a, a hut where no one lived. So he, he was allowed to live in this small building uh, <clears throat> in the shrine. Uh, and he lived there 10 more years until 68. Uh, that is uh, 1826. And uh, when he was, he became 2068, uh, it was difficult for him even to live by himself alone in a, uh, <clears throat> in a very quiet place, not too far from from the town, but since it became difficult for him to live alone, that means to uh, you know, prepare meals and all other you know, day to day things. So in this year, he moved to uh, someone whose name was Kimura. Families, this, were, this family has a, a rich family and he, they had a big uh, property and within a garden, uh, he, they had a small house. So the Kimura family allowed Ryokan lived in that uh, place. So probably uh, after this, uh, Ryokan didn't do Takuhatsu. Uh, and uh, he lived five more years, and he died in 1831. So he was uh, 73 years old. That was uh, his life. <clears throat> so uh, he escaped his family business, and he also escaped from Soto the monastery and he became a very free person and uh, stayed by himself, lived by himself. 
in a, uh, in a hermitage on, mount, on this mountain or uh, in this shrine. So most of his adult life was very uh, quiet and also free. And uh, he was well known for his uh, poetry. He made uh, Japanese poetry and Chinese poetry, uh, and both uh, haiku and waka in Japanese. And he wrote many uh, Chinese, Chinese poetry. And he was also very good at uh, calligraphies. And he became a friend of so many people, uh, both rich and poor, and even uh, uh, children. So he was a very well-known person in that area. But he wasn't known outside of that area until his death. And many of his friends are also well-educated people, so he could, uh, you know, lend uh, books and exchange the poetry. So he, uh, he was uh, not really a Zen master. He was a monk, and he continued to practice uh, Zazen, uh, taught by Dogen Zenji but he was not a Zen teacher. He never had a student or a, a disciple. That was uh, basically his uh, life. And I'd like to introduce one of his poems about Zazen. Uh, after he, he lived uh, at Kimura family's house. So he was older than 70. That poem is a part of uh, this book, I think chapter 8 of this book. So if you read this book, you can find this poem. Uh, <clears throat> So let me read the poem uh, in my translation. When I gave uh, talks at Berkeley Zen Center, I used I use the translation by uh, Abe Ryuichi and, uh, but he another person's name, Haskell. Anyway, uh, the title of the book was Great Fool. That is, uh, uh, I think, the best book about Ryokan's life and uh, poetry. But uh, Tonen asked me to, to make my own translation because often I didn't agree with their translation. So uh, the Ryokan's poems in this book is my translation. And my translation of this poem is as follows. Uh, looking back, I see more than 70 years have already passed. I tired of seeing through right and wrong in the human world. Snow in the late night covers all traces of coming and going. I stick a stick of incense burned by the old wind I sit. Uh, let me read it again. Looking back, I see more than 70 years have already passed. I tried, tried of seeing through right and wrong in the human world. Snow in the late night covers all traces of coming and going. A stick of incense burns by the old wind I sit. 
actually in the original uh, poem, uh, this I sit is not there. This is my addition. He didn't say I sit, but he only said a stick of incense burned by the old window. Uh, this stick of incense is Ichu. Uh, Ichu is uh, the uh, length of time, uh, one stick of incense burned. And when we practice the Zen, we uh, light incense offered to the Monjushuri statue. And uh, usually one period of the Zen is uh, about one hour, sometimes 15 minutes, sometimes time 40 minutes. That is originally the length of time uh, one stick of incense are burned. So only saying one stick of license burning, it means he's sitting. So uh, with that saying, I sit with uh, Japanese people or people who knows uh, Zen literature, see he was sitting. But in English, it's not uh, clear. So I added, I sit. So in this poem, he was more than uh, 70, 17 year, 70 years old. And he lived in a small uh, house in this family. Uh, and the first uh, line he said, I looking back, I see more than 70 years have already passed. You know, I first read uh, Ryokan, uh, Ryokan's, you know, funny stories when I was an uh, elementary student, pupil, around 10 years old. Uh, but uh, to me, he was just a funny, you know, monk, funny old monk. But uh, after I started to study Buddhism at the university, I know more about Ryokan. <clears throat> So around, around when I was 20 years old, I know his poetry. And when I was 20, you know, 70 years old person was very old. I couldn't, uh, you know, imagine how, you know, 70 year old person was like. But uh, now, you know, almost 50 years later, I'm older, older, than, older than him. You know, he died 73. I, now I'm 73 years old. So it's kind of strange feeling, you know, when he wrote this poem, he was younger than me. It's really a uh, you know, strange feeling. You know, I don't, I could, still now, I cannot imagine he was old, younger than me. He was always, you know, old monk. So it's interesting to me to read this, this poem. You know, this was written when Ryokan was younger than me. So I feel, you know, I'm very old. But he said, you know, I see more than 70 years have already passed. I tired of seeing through light and long in a human world. Uh, human world is Ningen. Uh, in modern Japanese, Ningen means human beings. Uh, Nin is part, uh, human or person, and gen is like a space, so human space. And this, as a Buddhist uh, term, ningen means uh, human realm within the six realms of sansara. We are born into human realm, that is ningen, and 
a file we are in this realm we are called Nyan. The uh, living beings, living living beings, uh, living within human realm. That is what a human being or Nyan means uh, in uh, Japanese. And within this human world, you know, people think in terms of good and bad or right and wrong. This is how uh, we commonly think uh, with, within our conceptual, intellectual way of thinking. We make kind of distinction between good, bad, right, wrong, or I love or I hate, love and hatred, or something is variable or not variable. This, this discrimination is the way, you know, we think and uh, within this human world. And Dogen, and I'm sorry, Ryokan is saying he was tired of seeing through, seeing through is the nature of this way of thinking. You know, the uh, measurement or yardstick to make such a distinction between good, bad, right, wrong, uh, love or hatred is not uh, uh, really reliable. So in sometime, uh, in some age, people have certain a uh, system of value and in the uh, uh, other time, you know, when Ryokan lived, uh, the basic uh, measurement of good and bad, right and wrong is the Confucianism. But today we think you know, Confucianism is uh, ancient. It's very different from how modern Japanese, uh, today's modern Japanese, I think. And also depending upon the place, uh, you know, the yardstick of right and wrong or good and, and bad is really different. You know, Japan and America or China or other, you know, people, other countries, you know, we have different uh, measurement. And not only the, such a, you know, big different uh, places or ages, but even within our family, you know, we have different measurement, uh, you know, older people and young people, you know, generation, generation gap uh, is uh, very subtle, but it's not uh, easy to go through. So he said after he became 70, he was uh, tired of thinking or making judgment uh, within such a measurement of, uh, you know, right and wrong within human way. And this is very kind of a natural thing as a, a Buddhist monk. Uh, this way of thinking, kind of a discriminative thinking is called a, a conventional and a ultimate truth or reality is beyond discrimination. Uh, you know, uh, to make such a discrimination, uh, sometimes or often we use very uh, subjective uh, yardstick or sometimes we have objective yardstick, but both are discriminative. Objective means we are free, free uh, certain degree, we are free from uh, egocentricness. We try to see things objectively, uh, but uh, 
in Buddhism, uh, the prajna or Buddhist uh, highest or ultimate wisdom is beyond discrimination. And that is our, our Zazen practice means by letting go of thought, we let go of such you know, discriminations we use in, uh, in human world. So our Zazen is itself prajna, even though uh, uh, our Zazen practice is called prajna or wisdom, this is not one way of thinking, but uh, prajna is uh, letting go of thought or opening the hand of thought. Prajna should be practiced. When we think about prajna or when we think about emptiness, uh, we are still discrimination. Emptiness as a, as a concept, emptiness is the opposition of uh, forms or uh, discrimination. So uh, when we talk, now I'm talking about form and emptiness, still, in my fat, fat happening in my mind is I'm talking about two concepts, form and emptiness. When we are uh, thinking about form and emptiness, uh, it's not really emptiness. It's a concept about emptiness. So to see real emptiness as a prajna, we have to let go of thought. And so, you know, in the first sentence of the Heart Sutra, uh, Avalokiteshvara deeply practice Prajna Paramita. So Prajna Paramita is something that is practiced, not thinking about emptiness. And uh, <laughs> Avalokiteshvara sees the emptiness of five skandhas, or see the five skandhas as emptiness. So within practice, we see emptiness of all forms. So Fata, the Heart Sutra is saying is prajna is practice. I think that is a really important point. Thinking about prajna or thinking about emptiness is not really prajna. Still, we are within the realm of thinking. But uh, seeing the prajna by within our practice is not a final place. But this is our Zazen. So, Fen Do, not Dokan, I'm sorry. Ryokan, Fen Ryokan said, I tired of seeing through right and wrong in the human world is uh, within his Zazen, as I said, when he is writing about Zazen practice. And snow, third line, snow in the late night covers all traces of coming and go going. Coming and going means how we move around doing things within human realms. But the traces of how people do things based on you know this kind of discriminations are uh, within Zazen covered with snow, even though he's uh, describing the scenery of the uh, outside world outside of the of his small house, you know he. It seems, it seems it is snowing and snowing heavily. So the trace of you know, human beings, people walking here and there is uh, covered with snow. Snow is, the, um, is used as a prajna, as a uh, metaphor or a symbol of prajna. 
Uh, for example, uh, this is what I quote during Denzoe last week. Uh, Dogen. Dogen wrote a Waka poem about the snow. Uh, his waka, Dogen's waka is as follows. In the months of long nights, that is in the autumn around uh, November, in the months of long night, it snowed on the bright leaves. So it's in the autumn and the leaves are beautiful, you know, different colors. Some leaves are red, some leaves are yellow, some leaves are still green. And there are some, you know, evergreen trees. You know, each tree has different colors of the leaves. But on such a beautiful mountain with so many different colors, uh, unusually, it's early, uh, snow covered entire uh, mountains. That is the scenery Dogen is describing in this waka. In the months of long night, it snowed on the bright leaves. So all different colors of leaves are, cover, are covered with snow. It became completely white. And Dogen said, why don't these who see this, this scenery, why don't those who see this compose a poem. So, uh, you know, there are many different, different colors and those different colors were covered with snow, white. So, entire mountain become white and yet uh, the different various colors are still there. That is what, uh, According to Dogen, that is what our Zazen is. You know, even when we sit facing the wall, all different kind of thoughts are coming and going, depending upon our personal karmic consciousness, karmic nature. We may have different uh, thinking, even we sit in the, diff in the same zendo, but by letting go of thought or opening the hand of thought, you know, the snow, the, all those different uh, thoughts are covered with snow. That is one color, no differentiation, no discrimination. That is our Zazen. So our Zazen is not uh, killing all different kinds of colors, but all different kind of, you know, uh, leaves with different uh, uh, colors are covered with snow. That is what, in a, according to Dogen's teaching, that is what happening in our Zazen. So both, uh, discrimination and not discrimination are both there, but discrimination is covered with uh, non-discrimination or beyond discrimination. So both thinking not thinking and beyond the thinking are there. That is Dogen's description of our Zazen. So even though, you know, he said he was tired of uh, thinking good and bad, but that doesn't mean he don't care anything anymore. But, you know, around the same time, uh, <clears throat> they had a big earthquake where Ryokan lived, and more than 1,000 people were killed. Uh, and he wrote a poem about the earthquake, and he himself uh, visited the nearby town where you know, many people were killed. So he was not indifferent about the things happening, even though in Zazen he you know, was tired of thinking good and bad, but he had compassion and he was concerned with how people are. Uh, 
that is my understanding of this poem. And uh, finally, in the, the last line, he said, a stick of incense burned by the old wind. Uh, old wind is co so co uh, means old or ancient, and so is uh, wind. So within that, that small house, there must be a wind with a shoji wind. And it's kind of strange, you know, how can we say a wind can be a old or a new? But this, uh, in this case, this uh, old wind means old uh, wind is the way or the place we can see outside. So I think this wind is uh, wisdom and old means ancient wisdom from uh, of, of Buddhas and ancestors. So for him, Zazen is an old window or old uh, wisdom, which sees you know, this, uh, the traces of human activities are covered with snow. So both uh, discrimination and non-discrimination are there. Uh, this is what I have to say about this poem this morning. Uh, it's already 11. Uh, if we have time and if we have a question or a comment, uh, please give me. If you need to stop, I don't mind. <laughs> Is there any question or comment? I'm not sure how you'd like to handle questions. Um, if perhaps someone wants to put up the uh, hand raising symbol, which you can find in the reactions tab on the bottom, um, you can select raise hand and ask uh, Okumo Roshi a question. Okay, please. How can you go between um, wisdom and compassion so freely? I think compassion came from wisdom. And uh, compassion uh, and wisdom is from compassion. Or wisdom uh, is deepened by compassion. So actually is to our uh, one thing, you know, compassion and wisdom are uh, two sides of one Buddha. You know, uh, wisdom I and, uh, you know, in Shobogenzo Baika, he said five eyes, that is wisdom, and thousand eyes, that is uh, Avalokiteshvara's eyes, that is eye of wisdom. So I think uh, compassion and wisdom are always together. You know, com compassion came from the wisdom of we are all connected. So we share one life. Uh, I think that is a source of compassion. So compassion and like and dislike uh, our human uh, love that is opposition of hate are different. Compassion has no particular object. Does this make sense? Okay. Any other question or comment? Okay. I have a question. Okay, please. Would you mind um, just clarifying or repeating, you were talking about what we were doing in Zazen and you said, I think you said, Dogen said, thinking, non-thinking, beyond thinking, mm -hmm. but I missed the connection to the snow um, that many different types 
I mean, uh, what I think I heard was many different types. You know, we're all doing zazen, and every snowflake's different, but the snow all looks the same, or it's all together. I think snow is not thinking. Okay. You know, different colors are thinking, and snow is uh, no think, not thinking or hushirio, and uh, hishirio include both. Hishirio or beyond the thinking in my translation is uh, include both and neither thinking nor not thinking. So Dogen said our zazen is hishirio, which include both thinking and not thinking. Is, is this a question answer to your question? I think so. And and can you say something more about beyond thinking? Beyond the thinking. Uh, what can I say? Whatever I say beyond thinking is thinking. <laughs> uh, I think in Dogen's teaching, beyond thinking is, uh, you know, Dazen is not something we can uh, grasp or define using our thinking. Of course, we need to do so, but while we are thinking about Zazen or Hishiro, uh, we are thinking. So think beyond thinking is always beyond our, beyond the reach of our thinking or evaluation. So that is the, what is the word? Uh, absolute, uh, reality itself in which we have discrimination and we negate discrimination but within uh, beyond thinking or hisiro both are there i think you become more confused <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you thank you Anything else? Are there any other questions? Okay, if there's no question or comment, uh, thank you very much for listening to my talk. I hope I can visit a uh, great tree. Uh, Possibly next year, I think there's some plan. Uh, I'm not sure if the plan was determined or not, but I hope we can see uh, Tejo-san and Hasan. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Aishak-san. Um, at the end of a talk, we always give back the merit and we use Thich Nhat Hanh's um, way of doing it, which is call and response. Okay. <clears throat> May the merit of this practice. May the merit of this practice. Benefit all beings. Benefit all beings. And bring peace. And bring peace. Thank you so much for coming. And I really do hope that you're able to visit Great Tree next year. I know you were on the schedule, but I don't know what COVID-19 did to that. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for ev everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank I want to mention that today is a, a day of mindfulness and you can check the schedule online. I think I'll leave the window open. Is that what you want to do, Brian? Yes, if you would, please. And the schedule is in the chat if anyone would like to download that. Um, there are two period, long periods of Zazen in the afternoon, and then one following this. We'll take a 10 minute break. Okay. Thank you.